extraordinary. Later, I worked out that his family were probably refugees from the Great Leap Forward famine of 1959. But Lao Gao clearly loved his life here because he never seemed to stop smiling. But why this particular spot? It's the water nick that made them live here. It's much better than other ones that sold you here. Yeah. Yeah. Like the nomads in the Biga Valley and the Karez builders of Turpan, unfrozen water is the key to survival in a freezing desert. With a permanent supply of sweet well water, the family's herds of camels and goats had prospered, and their manure had fertilized the thin and sandy soil. But as Lao Gao showed us round his kitchen garden, I could scarcely believe it supported his entire family, currently seven strong, year round. The soil seems really fine. Did, does he have a problem with it blowing away? Some old Lao Gao explained that his windbreaks and the trees provided enough shelter. But, as if sensing my disbelief that this was a functioning garden, he took me to his winter store and proudly showed me the remains of last year's harvest. <laughs> oh, yes! It's your own deep freeze. See, lots of onions, bottles of peach. What are those things? Pumpkins? Uh, <laughs> Excellent! Yeah. You can keep going, going for the whole Gobi winter. I kept on having to pinch myself to remember that I'd walked three days across sand dunes to get here. We were in the middle of nowhere, but Lao Gao behaved as if he were living at number 34 Acacia Avenue, with solar-powered electricity and even satellite television. He wasn't just surviving here, he was thriving. The camels and sheep that he bred to sell at market may not have had the richest of grazing, but it was certainly extensive. Later that evening, Lao Gao treated us, alongside his large and extended family, to the bounty of his garden. And his homemade hooch was clearly the most important thing for us to sample. Cheers. Cheers. That's the Mongolian way, you have to do it. It was pretty good for a homebrew, and once you'd had one, it was easy to go for another. Thank you very much. How, how often does he have guests dropping in like this? Two times per month he gets visit us. Twice a month? That seemed like an extraordinary amount of traffic for this particular Acacia Avenue. I don't suppose many of those are from Europe, are they? <laughs> you mean me? One European visitor came through here over 700 years ago. Marco Polo in his travels along the Silk Road, and I think he was served the same food. It's now thought he probably didn't introduce pasta to Italy. But the dumplings Lao Gao's daughter was making were unmistakably tortelloni. So maybe he brought back a recipe or two. Oh. With the fruits of Lao Gao's personal distillery flowing, <sighs> This is strong stuff. <laughs> it wasn't long before Bruno lost the ability to translate. <laughs> what was all that, Bruno? <laughs> Some speech I could not <laughs> pick. <laughs> after, well, after three of that, uh, yeah, I'm well, sorry. Then, yeah. And, have a nice and I invented a new international language. <laughs> <laughs> Next morning, Bruno assembled the family for a ceremony. Lao Gao, Bogini Jagger. Did you know? I try, I try to guess him what it is. To repay his seven-year-old life-saving debt to Lao Gao, he had brought all the way from Graz a pair of the finest German precision optic camel searching binoculars. <laughs> Lao Gao seemed overjoyed with them. He seems yeah. pretty happy with that. Yeah. I think now he, even when he gets older, the eye is not so good. Yes. He has the sharp yeah. eyes. Yeah. He yeah. will find his camera. able to find his camera. Huh? Hi, Simon. How about? <laughs> As we left for the long march back to Jeeps and civilization, I realized that despite the Badain Jiran, and indeed the whole Gobi Desert, providing a generous living, at least in the places where there was access to water, 
for me, three days to the nearest corner shop was always going to be too far.